last session of this uh, meeting, uh, which is uh, sort of pell-mell of different things, but uh, maybe outlook into the future. And uh, I'm happy also to announce that uh, Sabine Ernst, who works now in London, will have uh, a lecture about uh, how to approach ablation of AF using magnetic uh, navigation and she prepared a pre-recorded uh, case for us. Uh, she does ablation now through the radial arteries, so it might be interesting, especially for people who do have uh, stereotaxis. And then we have uh, we have a talk by Peter Nozel and, and by Vivek Reddy. So that's for for the end of this of this meeting. So, in a half a minute, we have we can start and this uh, talk by Sabine Ernst from from London. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present at the 25th edition of the ICAM Prague um, workshop. I'm really really honoured. I'm very sorry that I will not be with you in person. It's just a matter of the travel arrangement and my um, impeding upcoming maternity leave that I can't be with you. So I hope um, you forgive me for this and I hope to be with you um, latest next year again. I have very fond memories of being in Prague doing live cases with Joseph and the team and, and Peter. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. Here you see my disclosures. <laughs> And I'm going to try to tell you something that um, I've been interested in for actually a number of years now. And you know that I have a, a big hobby, magnetic navigation or telerobotic navigation. Um, and for all the years that we're now doing this, we've always used the traditional access routes in most patients. And we have basically tried to mimic what we do with our hands and use the magnetic system for it. And we have kind of ignored a bit the advantage of the system that you can steer only the tip, but it doesn't really matter what the proximal parts of the catheter do. And the only place where we do this um, better is when it comes to congenital heart disease. But let me just state in the beginning that um, actually it should be now 2023 here that this system can ablate all kinds of arrhythmias, any atrial tachycardia, any supraventricular tachycardia, any VT, any VF, epicardial or endocardial, it really doesn't matter. Um, it's available has been shown equivalent in multi-center trials for all of these arrhythmias. And of course, radiation exposure is low. You can allow a zero fluoral procedures with that. And of course, the operator sits outside. I don't need to tell you all the details. The only real occlusion for magnetic navigations are cochlear implants in my experience. But having said that, of course, we use the system where the system has its biggest benefits. And I see that in patients with congenital heart disease. So this is a very old paper I published more than 10 years ago with the initial experience here at the Brompton when I joined <clears throat> and showing that by using a retrograde approach across the aortic um, valve and then the systemic ventricle in most patients, we're easy to ablate all kinds of atrial arrhythmias um, without being much limited. Um, I've never done a transbuffle or a transhepatic puncture here in the last 15 years. And as the catheter is so versatile, you can make loop it several times around here. This is, for example, a TCPC patient. We have been very happy to do retrograde um, procedures in congenital heart disease. It has been very well. The most times that we do this, and you see here an example, is that we merge with 3D DICOM images from either MRI or CT scans. This is another lateral tunnel patient here. You can see that we <clears throat> easily can track the ablation catheter. This is on the Carter system merge with the existing scan and then basically move 3D in this patient's complex heart. Um, you see here someone with a common atrium and a single ventricle here. Very interesting ventricular configuration. So we would go retrograde across the aortic valve, through the VSD, across an AV valve, through an ASD, and then map the entire um, native atrium. So that's something that we do quite frequently, um, about 70 to 80 procedures a year at the Brompton. And that's where the strength of the system has been. 
Now, in some patients, um, a conventional approach, even if it would be a, a normal heart, would be impossible. And this is patients that are born, for example, with an interrupted IVC. You see here on the left-hand side such an example. Again, a 3D reconstruction. You can beautifully see the azygous continuation that comes up, bypasses the heart, and then enters the SVC kind of in a hockey stick-like approach. Now, doing a transeptal via the azygous vein is essentially impossible. So if this patient would present with atrial fibrillation, um, the only alternative route to a retrograde approach would be a transjugular transeptal puncture. Now, equally, if you have blocked femoral veins, this is a young patient here on the right-hand side as an example. Uh, again, a superior um, approach for transeptal punctures would be um, feasible but are technically quite challenging. This is, to my knowledge, the largest series, again, published from my group um, two years ago, uh, with six procedures in some of the congenital patients and some patients with um, blocked femoral veins. Um, it's quite tricky. I'll show you a picture uh, later on in the case discussion that we have in the um, case in the box. So show a little bit more details about this. But essentially, it's tricky as long. You have a lot of radiation exposure in this. It might not be um, successful because the septum is tilting away from the actual puncture site. Now, why is that so exciting? Because that led us to think about, can we use the magnetic system in any other way? As I told you, you're seeing the floppy tip of this catheter and you're changing the direction of the tip. So does it actually matter where you're coming from? And the answer is no. And the experience of the COVID pandemic and being seconded to ITU um, made me consider all kinds of access routes to vascul the vascular system again, including learning from the so-called PIC line team um, how to put lines in the arms, for example, just to overcome access limitations that we had in this chronic, uh, chronic COVID patients. So we came up with the arm approach arm sends for alternative access for remote magnetic navigation and basically means puncturing any other vessels beyond the jugular or subclavian and come from further um, apart. So it mimics a little bit and it's not fully yet a radial approach but it mimics and it is leading towards doing a procedure from a radial approach and the beauty of that is again the magnetic system allows you to do so. Now how large are the vessels, for example, of the of the arms? They are actually sufficiently large in most people. So this is a subset of, uh, I think, 63 patient, uh, volunteers, not patients, but volunteers, essentially all the Catholic people in, in the Brompton. We looked at the vessel diameters for both the veins and the brachial artery. And as you can see here in those graphs is that essentially in all of those um, colleagues, we had at least one vessel that would be large enough to house an eight French catheter, which is the limit, of course, of the ablation catheter. Smaller vessels, um, typically that's the basilic vein, and smaller vessels can be accessed as well for the brachial or the cephalic vein. So for smaller diagnostic catheters, you can easily do that. So you have a choice of vessels. And you see here a, um, just an example of the brachial artery uh, with the two brachial veins here right and left uh, of, this, of this left arm. So the technique on how to do this is an ultrasound guided technique. As nowadays, every central line is punctured with ultrasound. Um, that's very easy. The same technique is the ultrasound guided Seldinger technique. So you see the vessel, uh, you puncture with a small needle set, ideally with a radio opaque um, echogenic needle tip. And then you aspirate same way, Seldinger essentially. What you see on the ultrasound is that you see the echogenic tip. You can see it, you can walk it down um, to the vessel. You see it in the vessel, you aspirate, of course. And of course, you can visualize <clears throat> all the other tissues here, the artery again and the, the second brachial vein. So technically, that is very simple and straightforward. It doesn't really differ from the uh, pick line um, established work process. Here you can see the long access view and in-plane technique. I find that quite more difficult, but the nice thing is here you can see the bevel of the needle and then you can see once <clears throat> you've advanced the wire, you can make sure that the wire is nicely in the vessel. And of course, you can follow the, the, the wire up as well if you like. So that is um, giving you the access side. And this is an example from um, a patient 
I'm going to show you a bit more details for. We had a venous axis here and then had to, because of a left lateral pathway, an arterial eight French sheath here and a young lad. Um, you see here the cardio drive that is necessary for the magnetic system, so you can um, use the mechanical drive for the forward backward movement. The magnetic system only, or the magnetic field only, um, turns the catheter, the direction of the catheter, but not the forward backward. That's the mechanical one. But you can easily fix that to the side of the arm and then align the arm um, when the magnetic uh, when the magnet's coming into navigate position. So very very straightforward. Here's the example of that case, left lateral pathway, as I told you, um, two catheters, a diagnostic catheter in the right ventricle with some proximal electrodes here to capture the atrium. And the magnetic catheter, you can see here with a CARTO icon, of course, this is on CARTO RMT, um, has mapped the aorta, has passed the aortic valve, just entered the left ventricle, and now is mapping along the mitral annulus. You could easily pass the mitral valve, but you can map from either ventricular or the atrial um, insertion of the accessory pathway. We did so um, and ablated successfully for this young man who had blocked femoral veins. And you see the fluoros fluoroscopy time in total le less than a, a minute procedure duration. One of the first cases that we did, 120 in total, with a ablation time of a little bit more than two minutes. Now, can we do more than this? Yes. Um, first of all, let me show you how the arms look afterwards. This is 10 days of the same patient after the procedure, so you can hardly see this is the puncture side. And the nice thing is not only was it possible to do that without the risk of pneumothorax, so there was no need for chest x-ray afterwards. There's no need for bed rest either. For simple procedures, it could easily be a day case. We, we admitted this, this young uh, patient overnight, but nevertheless, it could have been done as a day case. Cost effectiveness, if you think it through, we need less catheters. You can do most of the arrhythmia um, treatments that we're doing with with two catheters probably, especially if you have the spacing um, and the electrode configurations of your diagnostic catheter in a, in a clever way. And actually some of the patients expect that from us. They're asking, you know, how do you actually do the case when you consent them for ablations? And they ask if you can do it from the arm. And so far we had always said, hmm, would love to, but uh, we can't. But now we've established that we can. <clears throat> Now, let me show you um, the experience so far. It's not massive, of course, but it's a um, experience that is quite diverse. We've done some SVTs. We've done some left-sided pathways, as I showed you, a large cohort of PVCs, some atrial tachycardia and congenital heart disease, some primary artery denervation, some atrial flutter, and then a cohort of atrial fibrillation and congenital heart disease. And um, that has been actually very um, promising. Now, let me remind you before I come to the rest, and I'm going to show you a detailed case for the AF ablation in the case in the box. Um, I just remind you to say, when did transradial approach for coronary intervention started? It actually is a long time ago. And initially, it was a niche. It was just, yeah, just done for coronary angiograms in 1989. And then the first reports of PCI um, were added. And it just took a time for this to take off. And the nowadays, I would guess that about 90% or more of all coronary interventions are done from a radial approach. And of course, there was a lot of technical <clears throat> advancements here, slender sheath, different wires, different guides. Um, everything is now geared towards this. And I predict the same, or I hope to predict the same for uh, the EP procedures from the arm. Now, what's the benefit, you know, besides the fact that there is no bed rest and you might have a, a quicker turnaround, but you see that um, the success rates are similar, the risk is lower, um, especially for exercise complications and major bleeding. And this is from chronic, chronic total occlusion um, interventions, so that's a large meta-analysis. So I think overall, if we think it through, there's a good chance that this could be successfully applied to electrophysiology as well. And I see no real reason why. It now, let me conclude and say um, we can already ablate everything if we just mimic the manual approach with magnetic navigation. There's a nice impact on radiation exposure, obviously, for the operator who sits outside. People like me um, that are um, pregnant have much less radiation exposure. That's actually very nice as well, of course. Um, 
the ablation itself is as good as manual. Um, we hope to apply things like pulse field ablation, of course, as well, as well in the magnetic world. Um, but the real fact that you steer the tip of the catheter is pretty cool. And now we can think about alternative access. And I think, um, I hope that we can establish the arm EP first hashtag very soon. So thanks a lot for your um, attention. We will follow with a pre-recorded case by Sabine. Dear colleagues, I hope you can see me and hear me well. Um, this is a, the recording of my case in the box for the ICAM meeting, the 25th edition at, the Pro, at Prague. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen in a moment and you will see my Presentation, I hope. Yes, here we are. Um, yeah, I'm going to show you a case of a procedure um, that we performed, actually two procedures in a patient that we performed uh, here at the Royal Brompton Hospital. And you will see that um, we're struggling quite a lot with this patient. This is a 53-year-old patient with symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation with breakthrough episodes of AF and uh, taking quite a lot of flaconide. She has left atrial isomerism, um, uh, dextrocardia with a situs inversus, polysplenia, bilateral supracaval super, um, veins with a right-sided SVC draining into the coronary sinus, left-sided draining into the systemic venous atrium, which is on the left side, an interrupted IVC with a uh, azygous continuation and severe aortic kinking. Here's a 3D reconstruction of a CT scan of the same patient, and you'll see put here AP inferior um, and then LA1 ARIO views here and for your information. And you see that the heart is pointing towards the right. <clears throat> the aorta is anterior, uh, is well, central, you could say. So it's versus the right atrium is on the left hand side. You see that um, there is an azygous continuation, so interrupted IVC and the venous blood from the legs come up, turn around and then enter the right, um, I'm sorry, the left-sided um, SVC right here and then goes into the right atrium. So all venous access from femoral would be through here. Um, access from superior would be from here via the, that SVC. And of course, the pulmonary veins, you see that here a little bit in the inferior view, squeeze together a bit and elongated. So kind of a funny rotation as well. And please also note that this patient has quite a substantive kinking in her um, aorta. So instead of having a normal aortic arch, there is a very tough kink here, um, which prevented us from contemplating a retrograde approach much earlier. So let me let me show you. And the first procedure that I've performed in 2020 for this patient, and she was referred from another congenital center here in London, and they had tried to do a cryo balloon ablation with a superior approach, which was very, very difficult. And um, I show you uh, here pictures. I show you a couple of more pictures in the procedure a little bit later. This is from one of our present um, publications on transeptal punctures. You see, we typically use a radio frequency needle. Um, in combination with everything in this kind of patient that you, you can employ. Um, situs and versus, so puncture is from left juggler. TOE probe to help with the positioning and the tenting. Uh, you see contrast given here. Uh, finally, left atrium is, is um, entered. And then finally, and this is a conventional catheter, um, the catheters are, are put in a left atrium. Very, very difficult. Um, approach and I would show you um, how this case was specifically done. I'm just going to exit this and join my Odyssey system. You see that here um, hopefully and you see the recording. So again this is from the case itself 
from the Odyssey platform. So all the magnetic cases are recorded on this platform. And again, here to illustrate the excessive kinking of the author, um, which basically meant that we felt that this way retrograde is not an option. Retrograde <clears throat> procedures in congenital heart disease is actually something that we do nearly all the time. So that would have been my first choice. But seeing that our author, I thought I would not be able to negotiate this um, this path. Now, you also see the Azagai's continuation here once more. And I'm just going to jump forward and show you again how we did this um, in the transjugular approach procedure. So here we see a Dekanov catheter that was created or used to create a matrix. And the nice thing here is you have the the picture in picture display on the on the Cato RMT system. So that was nice. You can create the anatomy, you can merge adequately, you can orient yourself better on your X-ray reference um, pictures. And by doing so and mapping everything, you can see that we can create matrix around the entire left atrium that helps with visualization of the radio frequency needle tip. I use a Bayless system, um, which has an isolated tip, uh, which is very nice, especially when, as you can see here, the septum is pointing away from you. You don't have to push that strongly. It's not about mechanical pressure. You basically burn through the septum. And that's my go-to technique when I do congenital patients, um, puncturing through patches and so on. And in fact, because the trick of visualization of the needle tip, as you can see here, or you will see in a moment, on the Carter system is is nice. It allows for a zero fluoro even in normal patients. So that's my zero, typical um, CAR to zero fluoro approach for atrial fibrillation patients. But I'm just going to show you a couple of things here. So here the catheter is in the hemiozygous, just so that you can see that um, reconstructed as well. Here the Dekanov catheter does that right here. And then uh, we put, just because it was relatively easy to mechanically interrupt her AV node conduction to put a safety catheter in the in the right ventricle as well so that we were able to pace her from the ventricle if that was needle that was necessary. Here is the RF needle tip visualization. It's a bit hard to see because we fake it as a little catheter. You see it here, there's a little one, two on the bottom two screens. And that shows where the needle tip is on X-ray. You see X-ray here as a small call out and that should be relatively easy. Eventually, it will be uh, moved to the to a better position. Of course, this is confirmed with TOE. You see, this is already a bit better, but you see the problem, the septum points away. So it's kind of a difficult thing to achieve. Um, so I'm going to jump forward possibly to this scene and um, show you that we eventually managed to get in. Um, quite difficult to get to the right place and do a safety transeptal puncture. Again, you see here the needle, and then eventually the needle will happen to go in. Massively um, turning, this is a steerable sheath, which is far too long. I don't have, didn't have access here to the uh, short agile sheath. Um, so eventually we get the sheath and, and the needle. You'll see that it's agonizing to watch it even on, see it here on the X-ray pushing the sheath in, uh, now it's in, and that was the transjugular transeptal. Now, because this is an awkward position and otherwise you would need to perform the procedure from the neck position, I choose to use magnetic navigation here. So I'm having the magnetic catheter in here, you can see it nicely on X-ray, and then uh, we did the remainder of the procedure on with magnetic navigation. Of course, it's nice the operator sits outside. Uh, let me show you, we mapped the left atrium. She has two separate veins for the septal upper and septal lower, and then two separate veins for the lateral upper and lateral lower. Normal left atrium appendage, quite a wide um, ridge here. Of course, remember she has a persistent <coughs> SVC or bilateral SVC, so there is a big, I could say, um, vein out outside here. And that, of course, makes the ridge very, very thick, and it's quite hard to um, stay stable. You can see it's easy to move the catheter around. Magnetic navigation is beautiful because it has a soft catheter. You, the catheter aligns to the direction of the magnetic field. You can see that nicely. It's very easy to reach everywhere, and um, you don't have to make any awkward hand movements or so on. You just can 
uh, steer the tip. It doesn't really matter if the catheter here is looped three times or where it really comes from. Now, let me tell you that in this procedure, we did pulmonary vein isolation. She has paroxysmal. She had normal voltage. You can see that here, a beautiful voltage. And we did um, a ipsilateral ablation line around the septal pulmonary veins and then one for the lateral pulmonary veins. I'll show you here the end result. Um, this is a feature that you see down here that's called ablation history that shows you how much energy has been deployed, uh, deployed via the catheter. It uh, has a number of factors that are taken into account, and in any case, we mapped them in voltage afterwards or abated in the veins. So that was the first procedure. Unfortunately, this patient had a recurrence. Now, let me just quickly go back to my PowerPoint presentation, just one second. So you see it's the same patient, um, but this time, because the transeptal puncture was such a go and it took forever, we decided to go. And actually, it was a was really a, a decision on on the morning of the procedure because I feared this this redo procedure so much, and I felt that I would have such a hard time going through the transeptal to the septum that I went through uh, a different approach. I applied an arm approach, so. I punctured the brachial artery in this case because her radial artery is too small and the catheter came up because the first branch was after the kink that I showed you before and we mapped here the aorta and performed essentially a retrograde approach. You can see here the image integration already. Um, the reconstruction of the right atrium was done with um, the decanaf as before. I and mean, you can see here the, the left Persistent SVC, of course, it's cytos inversus. So here is the here is the um, big ridge basically on the epicardium. But see, that's equal to a um, vein of Marshall. Okay, so here you can already see we're in the aortic root. I jump a little bit forward. It's very easy to cross the aortic valve. Um, just a bit later, um, we'll get into the left atrium. I'm just going to jump forward so that you can see that entering the left atrium as a simple task, uh, very easy with this retrograde approach. And um, again, I'm catheter is aligning in the magnetic field direction, as you can see here. If there's an obstacle, it's too soft to push anything away. It just won't go. So you can uh, try all kinds of crazy moves if you, if you need to. Now, here's the left atrial map. That's the start of it. And then um, mapping the veins again. And the challenge here was really the ridge towards the left atrial appendage. Now, see again, we can easily reach in the veins here. This is not an issue. The catheter, if you have a brachial artery approach, <coughs> is uh, long enough. It's, you can possibly loop it three, time, three times in the in the left atrium. That's not an issue with that. Uh, you can see here here we are on the ridge, and we have very big signals on this on this side. So um, I jumped forward quite a bit because we tried to map very carefully all the veins again, and we saw reconnection of the lateral um, pulmonary veins. So that's what we were starting doing here. There was AF induction and then um, eventually also termination. Again, the rest of the left atrium is normal in voltage, no other substrate really. She is paroxysmal. She just has a very... Um, <laughs> very different anatomy. Well, at some point, we felt that ablating on the ridge from endocardial is not doing the trick completely. So we went also into the left SVC, and um, which is on the right side. It's con slightly confusing. You can see again how easy the catheter can go in here. Um, again, a brachial approach for that. Um, and we have also normal voltage in the right atrium, very easy to move and Turn around, and we elected to ablate here in the in the um, in the <clears throat> left SVC as well. I isolated the right SVC equally. Remember, this patient is left atrial isomerism, so there is no sinus node to mention. So there's an atrial escape. Eventually, we cardioverted this patient as she did not convert during any of our RS. And you can see again the ablation history here: ablation from endo and epicardially on the ridge. And finally, that was. Um, the end of the procedure case is finished. I think I have the x-ray times here somewhere. Uh, 
not sure, maybe not. But again, the whole thing was done with very little radiation as opposed to the um, long procedure that we did uh, last time. Now, the transeptal puncture with the jugular approach takes a lot of X-ray. And of course, with this arm approach, because you have the image and image integration, you don't have to um, do this anymore. So let me show you, I go back to the presentation mode here and say, um, to floor time for this redo procedure was two minutes, 14 seconds. The three, the procedure was three hours long and we reached everything and that was really nice. Um, now, if you think this, this whole concept further, you could say, ah, you could do this for congenital heart disease, but maybe, um, you know, what <laughs> could we do it for more patients? Now, the nice thing about transeptal punctures, of course, and transeptal conventional approaches is that you could have a mapping catheter that you put in your target area, you map around it or you blade around it, and you see um, kind of the loss of the signals, you see the isolation um, directly. That would be quite nice. Um, at the moment, of course, we are limited, as everyone is limited, by radio frequency current, and there is just a very... Um, Preliminary experience with PFA in this is um, very much just in the test phase. It's not experimental. Um, it's not far from clinical use at the moment. And of course, if you think further, you could say, ah, if the catheter would be any thinner, then you could possibly not puncture only the brachial artery, but you could puncture the um, radial artery and it would become a, a true radial approach. So ARM stands for alternative access remote magnetic navigation. At at the moment, it's really an ARM approach. So it's really puncturing up here, but it would be so cool to do it from here. Now I've done that in PVC ablations, and if you if you have a man and then the vessel is large enough, of course he can go for that. Um, in AF, I fear it's a bit. Um, it's not for all comers. Let's put it this way. Um, let me repeat why I think ARM is cool. Huh? There is no need for bed rest. It's a shorter recovery time for sure. This patient, the transeptal, transjugular approach had basically hematoma until here that took a number of weeks to um, resolve. We don't need to do this TSP puncture where the septum is pointing away from us. It's much, much easier. Um, it's, it's a, let's say it's an easy procedure. And of course, um, if you don't have to go transeptal, potentially more operators could perform such a procedure. As you probably know, telerobotic support is very easy on magnetic navigation. You can sign in each other's system and um, an experienced operator could join and not as experienced operator to do this kind of case. So let me conclude and say, I think yeah, it's time to move a little bit further. I've shown you a very complex congenital case that benefited from this ARM approach made access to the left atrium much easier. Uh, and we have done so in many, many congenital patients in the last 15 years, at least in the time that I've spent here at the Brompton. Um, alternative access, of course, would be cool and lacks completely in the, in the, the need for pneumothorax exclusion afterwards. It's much safer. You just have large enough vessels in most patients where you can do that. Uh, a proper radial approach, I think, is feasible. But ideally, would have slightly longer catheters. We're a little bit afraid that the catheters won't reach far enough, or we're not going to reach the final end. And of course, thinner would be better. Thinner would allow us to come to a radial approach with a sheath side that is comparable to um, interventional coronary um, procedures. And that would make it easy. All the closure things, all the tricks that they have learned over the last 30 years would be applicable here then as well. <clears throat> so I hope that the hashtag arm EP first will catch on and yeah, I might stay tuned and I uh, hope you will hear more from us um, in the coming months and yeah, weeks and months probably. So I thank you very much for your attention and I'll close my presentation here. Happy to take any questions. Well, th this was pre-recorded and uh, Sabine agreed to, to join discussion, but the discussion is planned at the end of the procedure, so we don't have her online. And uh, now the next talk should have been by Peter, but he left because ah, he's coming. 
because he's chasing uh, Vivek ready. Uh, so I hope he finally yeah. got him. So it's now your turn, please. Okay, thank you, <coughs> Joseph. Okay, so Vivek is, uh, will be online, so it's, everything is working, okay. Oh, guys, I, I got from Joseph a very not easy task to uh, answer uh, if the novel structure procedures for LV remodeling, and you know that I'm a little bit crazy by LV remodeling, but uh, after yesterday cases, or the VT cases, everybody who is dealing the VT, I mean ischemic VT or st substrate VT, uh, we know what does di mean diseased left ventricle. So actually the question is if we can by remodeling of LV, decrease arrhythmic uh, storming and arrhythmic, arrhythmic um, events. So that's my disclosure. So actually, we really need to think what kind of uh, remodeling we are speaking about. Because, uh, for example, if we have really um, dilatation of the LV, so with increasing end systolic volume index, is clearly worsening the prognosis. So we need to think in which status we can put uh, we can put this lessening of the remodeling when we can stop some this process to don't end up with LVADs or heart transplant. So we don't really know what we can get. The problem is that the stitch trial, which is like 20 years ago, uh, since then, didn't answer properly the question. When the surgeons got the heart in the body actually and lessened by remodeling, I mean, aneurysmectomy, and it was comparative study with the patients, I mean, uh, with the patients with ischemic heart uh, disease, they got coronary artery bypass, actually graft, and then aneurysmectomy, plus or minus. So usually they don't perform or they perform aneurysmectomy in these patients. So they randomized these patients and they didn't find any good results. Actually, the aneurysmectomy group was even worse. But when they sub-analyzed the patients with effectively lessen the end systolic volume index, that this patient, the patient group, really create better. So the same question, and this is a very nice slide from, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, like uh, uh, Philly group, I mean, from University of Pennsylvania group. So actually, um, uh, this is really interesting, I mean, uh, association between end systolic volume index and less remodeling can create less arrhythmic events. So one of the <clears throat> uh, first, uh, I mean, hybrid procedure, I would, I cannot tell you that it's like just transcatheter only, but it's a hybrid procedure. Uh, it's so-called bioventrix or revivant system. So what is the procedure about? So we have a hybrid room, surgeon and interventional cardiologist or somebody like me sitting in the, in the same patient on the other sides of the table. So surgeon make puncture through the left ventricle. Actually, this procedure is designed only for the patients who are with like post MI with aneurysm dedicated, either MRI or either uh, CTI, dynamic CT. They need to have a scar on the septum, so you need to prove that they have a scar on the septum. The surgeon make a puncture from the left ventricle free wall underneath the aneurysm, going through uh, the septum, uh, interventricular septum. So uh, on the other side, interventricular cardiologist, I'm sitting there, I'm standing there and putting through the jugular vein, snare, close to the septum. So I catch his needle or his uh, like PTCA wire and I'm wiring the wire through this heart. So actually, again, from surgeon side, left ventricle open, just minimal invasive. 
uh, left rear wall through the septum to the jugular vein. And all this, uh, like, like trolley, like this, this, this um, on this, on this um, wire, you apply then the anchors. So then you can effectively lessen the aneurysm, exclude the aneurysm, okay? And the, in principle, you are going through this visible here. So again, going through the left ventricle free wall, going through the septum to the right side. But actually, uh, decision how much anchors you can create. So you can go one, two, three anchors in terms of uh, what you want to lessen. Uh, if you want to be effective, you, well, okay, it's not working, the movie, so it doesn't matter. So, okay, so it's in principle is the same. So, so if you uh, exclude the aneurysm effectively, means that uh, you can lessen the end systolic volume index. And it's visible here, finally. So it's the aneurysm prior the procedure. And this is, oh, sorry, again, it's not working. Why is it not working? It was going well before. No, it's still not working. At least these two pictures, okay. Why is it, what you did? I just turned off the pointer. Okay, pointer. Why pointer? I have no pointer here. Okay, so, uh, so we have a, like, left ventricle before, and left ventricle after. So you can see uh, the changes. And so we have a, our series of patients. We did like over 50 patients. And actually we map them, some part of the patients, we map before and after the exclusion. You can see here the left ventricle, right ventricle uh, on the like Carto map, voltage map, substrate map. And the exclusion of the aneurysm is very effective. But the problem is that you have some like folder, so you have some some space in between. Okay, so just we'll show later. Uh, so when we analyze our first series of patients, we found that we have less inducibility of VT because when we map them before, we map them after. So we lessen the in, uh, inducible of VT very significant level. But it's just a non-normalized trial. It was just feasibility trial. We did without out of protocol, so it was not any, any uh, reliable data. But you can see here how much we change by this procedure. And actually, if you compare with the stage cardiac surgery data, it's a much more effective method how to, uh, how to uh, create this outcome. So this is European data, which is really similar as our. And this, uh, this is a case report uh, published uh, by Karl Hans Cook. And I, I would stress here, it's not, not just still this picture only. So uh, it's excluded aneurysm. And the patient got VT. And you can see here, the, uh, like the Carto map. And the VT exit was going from here. So actually, he put the catheter in, into the folder. Okay, I will show here. Into the folder. And actually, he tried to ablate from the channel, uh, from the exclude aneurysm. And remember, we are in the Prague ablation workshop. We did 2015. This guy, it's our guy, not Karl Hansko guy, our guy. Very similar, look at that. Exclusion aneurysm. Actually, we have a catheter in here, inside. And then we couldn't ablate that, so we used alcohol and we got alcohol ablation of this guy. And this guy was later on AFib ablation, I mean, three years uh, after that. He, well, again, it was maybe last year, or I don't know, last year. It was last year here for, uh, for uh, atrial fibrillation ablation. So, Revine trial um, actually is now finished. ID trial is not rolling, it's uh, finished. So, we will see what's happening with, I mean, the morphology, I mean, with, with uh, the, the procedure itself. And I can just indicate that it could be antiarrhythmic, but actually, I clearly show you that we still have a substrate 
we still have a 3D functionality, uh, functionality, functionality of the substrate. So we cannot say that we lessen ventricle tachycardia, despite we have some indication that we have less inducibility. Uh, another system, which is uh, another system, another uh, transcatheter uh, LV, LV remodeling system, is uh, transcatheter percutaneous ventricoplasty, a Cousinch system, which was originally involved to lessen mitral valve uh, insufficiency. But actually, the first feasibility trial. Uh, uh, regardless on the lesson or not lesson, the, uh, I mean the volume of of uh, the fraction of the regurgitant fraction uh, prove that the patients get better in terms of this very effective remodeling because it's like not annuloplasty, it's submitral, so it's like really ventricular plastic. So you put anchors. You put, uh, maybe it's visible here, you put anchors to the myocardium and through the, uh, the anchors going just wire and through this wire you have spaces in between the anchors to, to lessen your force. So then you can cinch, you can cinch the left ventricle, okay? So to effectively, look, it is, uh, it is visible here, by putting the anchors you lessen the volume and the diameter of left ventricle. It's visible here, the prior and after cinching, prior and after cinching. And these anchors are visible here on the spaceman on, the, on this um, autopsy. There are several um, examples, actually, uh, what you can do very effectively. And actually, the worldwide clinical trials are running. Uh, I would like to go to, the, to much more details, but we know that we can even comparable with this bioventrix trial of the bioventrix system. We can really very effectively lessen the diastolic and end systolic volume index. So again, much better than cardiac surgeons, or maybe better than cardiac surgeons during the time of, uh, of the stage trial. And so, <clears throat> Hopefully, this study, which is ID trial, which is just starting, uh, could answer if we are able with this remodeling again lessen the inducibility of VTs. And this is a question we don't know. So the the most prominent and most experienced uh, uh, remodeling is just this stupid mitral clip uh, procedure, okay, which is really adapted for mitral insufficiency. But actually, co-op study really proved that by this, and not this is the first was arrest, it was comparable study, mitral clips versus surgery, but then it was mitral clip uh, done uh, through this co-op study, which really, comparing the, the best medical therapy and the one-to-one -one randomization, mitral clip really, I, in co-op study, really improved the patients. And actually, it's not only reduced hospitalization, but actually it indicates that going good way, the mortality data, and actually they have much better uh, outcome in terms of risk reduction in the mortality base. So it's really, it's again, something which indicates this kind of remodeling is very effective. And finally, we have some data from uh, the Spanish group that they observe in their patients that they lessen the ventricle arrhythmia, like um, lessen the ventricle uh, arrhythmia induction and usually uh, when they compare they have less non-sustained VTs, they have less sustained VTs and they have even less ICD therapies in this patient population after mitoclip. So it indicates that might be, might be uh, some option. Parachute trial, again, 
another system, the parachute implantable device, which is over because company cardiokinetics is over, it's done. But actually it was some just idea how to lessen the volume by putting some just impl uh, like implanting some like parachute like umbrella to the apex of the left ventricle, like a kinetic left ventricle, but it was very passive. It was, it's really, it doesn't prove anything. So it was stopped at that time. Uh, the last system is a little bit strange system. I need to make you ready, this is really strange. Uh, named contraband. So which is uh, designed, this device is designed to place the stents to both PAs, so left and right pulmonic arteries, with dedicated orifice through the stent. So actually, what does it mean? You lessen the flow, you lessen the flow through the pulmonic arteries. It means you increase the gradient, you increase the gradient, but you got, I mean, less preload of the left ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. So you increase the pressure in the right side. So maybe you can get the shift from the RV, LV interventricular septum. So actually, surprisingly, the studies are, the study is running and the implanting procedure is visible here. So it's varying uh, step by step. So first right and left, or right and left doesn't matter. Uh, hopefully it'll be opening here. So you open the right uh, stand first. It's opening, 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 it's going, going, going. It's very dedicated, it's a very easy procedure. Actually you need to set up where is the landmark, when is the landing zone. Now the stand will be open, okay. And the same will happen on the left side. Again, now it's open. Okay. So actually, uh, the good uh, good uh, information for you to be not stressed too much. Uh, if we have a bad deployment, we can put a big balloon and we can uh, enlarge this orifice so we can open the uh, the, the artery, the pulmonary artery. This is uh, some example. Actually, this uh, really maybe our patient, I don't know, is like uh, six months after. So it's not just even worse, it's like a little bit better, okay? And so, so I wouldn't like to stress you too much with the data because we have no data. There are, there are some, some, some patients done. Uh, the feasibility trial should be finished in 55. Uh, patients and hopefully in two years we will know more. So uh, to summarize my talk is I would say that this transcatheter LV remodeling is feasible and time to time it's really showed that the LV and systolic volume index and diastolic volume index you can clearly lesson, you can really involve, you can really improve the patients, you can improve the hemodynamics, you can improve their outcomes, functionality. I have no any answer if this transcatheter procedures can lessen the ventricle arrhythmias. Okay, I would stop here and thank you for attention. So now, now we have to decide if we will have now discussion or if we can continue. Vivek is already online, so we can continue with Vivek and we have discussion at the end as was planned only originally. So we can connect to to US and Vivek will tell us uh, what is the future of catheter ablation procedure with some conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, Joseph. Hopefully you can uh, hear me right now. Yeah. Can we make it more loud? Can you hear us? Yeah. I, I can hear you. Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yeah, yeah. 
Good. Okay. Uh, we, we haven't seen you. We were missing you here. We were missing you here. It was very yeah. uh, intensive, uh, intensive uh, uh, workshop this year. Uh, we had also yeah. yesterday nice get together. Yeah, I have to say, I think this is the first Prague workshop in 20 years that I wasn't at, and I, I really missed it. I heard about both the intensive workshop and the intensive party. So <laughs> I missed both of them. <laughs> um, well, I, I really um, apologize that I'm not there in person. Um, I, uh, I definitely missed it. Um, if it wasn't an important personal thing, I wouldn't have, I definitely would have missed it. But anyway, um, uh, I'm glad to be able to to speak on on this topic. Um, so, Joseph gave me this very simple topic on the future gather ablation. So it's a pretty expansive topic, and I think what I'm going to do is try to focus the the presentation because in 15, 20 minutes, there's just not enough time to talk about too many subjects. Um, just know I have a number of disclosures, and I will be discussing uh, technology, and I'll point out what does not have. Uh, CE mark approval and what does have CE mark approval as we get to the to the presentation. Initially, I was going to talk about a lot of subjects uh, beyond AFib. I want to talk a little bit about about um, uh, cardioneuroablation as well as about ventricular tachycardia. But I think in the interest of time, we're going to focus on AFib ablation. But I do want to just make a few comments on other subjects, uh, and maybe I'll do that at the beginning. The first is. Um, very quickly, we'll talk about cardioneuroablation. I know that this was covered earlier, so I, I don't need to say too much about it. Um, but I do think that this is an area that electrophysiologists um, should focus more on. I think it's a these are patients that are helped tremendously by by cardioneuroablation. I think the big challenges for us as a field are number one: what is the lesion sets that's required? Um, th there are lots of lesion sets that are being uh, studied, some that are more expansive, some that are more focused, and I think that we really need to understand what's the minimal lesion set that can help these patients, and particularly their young patients, so we want to try to minimize the amount of ablation. Second, um, ventricular arrhythmias. I think this is a really exciting time in terms of treatment of ventricular arrhythmias. The, last year was the first time we've had randomized trials published in VT in a long time, and we had three of them that were published, SURVIVE and PARTITA and um, PAUSE SCD, and all of them showed favorable outcomes, but they were also uh, difficult to conduct trials. They took time to conduct, and, um, and I think that um, the challenges now are to translate these, these favorable outcomes into procedures that are let's say, technically a little bit more uh, streamlined. I think that's something that some of the newer ablation technologies like pulse field ablation, potentially the ultra-low cryo may really help us do. So I think that's very exciting. And the last point I want to make before getting into this talk proper is uh, ventricular fibrillation. There's a lot of new data, and I, I think some of this was discussed earlier. Uh, Michelle uh, Hassiger and his colleagues published on um, on substrate mapping of VF, uh, particularly in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. But um, and I think that's very exciting. There's also work that uh, Carla Paponi has been doing recently in terms of trying to substrate map the epicardial surface in patients that have electrical disturbances beyond Brigada syndrome. So I think these are very exciting areas that we need to understand better what is the role. So with that, let me start talking about AFib. I want to cover these subjects. The clinical data, because it's important to understand where the field is going. I'm going to talk a little bit about pulse field ablation, since I do think that's the future for AF ablation. A little bit of risk factor modification, and then this concept of pulse field mapping. So let's start with the clinical data. You really can't start talking about AFib without talking about the EAST AFNET4 trial. Now, I think this audience is well aware of the trial, so I'm not going to go to it in details. We know that patients are randomized to early rhythm control or usual care. And I think the key was that rhythm control is now modern rhythm control. Unlike in a firm, we now have dronetarone and we have a more frequent use of the 1C inhibitors, and we have um, uh, catheter ablation. It's also important that oral anticoagulation was used in the majority of patients. It was not withdrawn in the ablation patients, like happened in a firm. And this is what happened. Remember, the trial was stopped early because of significant improvement in the rhythm control group. Not only were there improvements in all the, uh, I mean, in the primary composite, but also in all of the components. 
There were improvements in hospitalization, though these did not reach statistical significance. But importantly, there was improvement in cardiovascular death, independently statistically significant, and also improvement in stroke. And this is particularly notable because remember, about 90% of the patients in both groups stayed on anticoagulation, which means that there's an additive benefit of rhythm control in preventing strokes even when taking or anticoagulants. I think that's a very important conceptual point that uh, was proven. I think the two other important sub-studies, I mean, there were a number of sub-studies that the investigators published, and I think they should be congratulated for that. Two of the more striking for me were this one, showing that the 30% of patients who were asymptomatic had the same benefit. And this one, patients with more comorbidities, the older patients, the sicker patients, in fact, had an even greater benefit. And those that had less comorbidities, of course, eventually do become older and have more comorbidities. So the point is that, that sinus rhythm is a good thing in AFib patients. By the way, there's another trial called Change AFib, which is a large randomized trial of rate versus rhythm, really focused on dronetarone versus usual care and patients coming in for uh, basically to the emergency room, so looking very early. And there's good reasons to think this is going to be a positive trial. Remember, a decade plus ago in Athena, where patients were randomized to dronetarone versus placebo, there was a 30% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, just like in East AFNET 4. So I think that this is going to be other day that will be very useful. What about catheter ablation? I think catheter ablation is going to play an increasing role. But we know, of course, about Kibata, and there are a lot of, let's say, controversies about Kibata. But one area that I think there's no controversy is this, which is that there's a 50% reduction in um, recurrences with catheter ablation compared to drug therapy. And this is on a KM curve. With, if you look at burden, the data looks even better, and we'll get to that. Um, but I think that what's really sort of pushing people more toward catheter ablation are a couple of things. One is the safety, which we'll talk about more when we get to pulse field. The second is the effectiveness, and we've seen this with a number of first-line ablation trials. And the third are data like this, and these are two trials. I think they're very important. One is the ATTEST trial, which all of you know, these are patients who, who had failed antiarrhythmic drugs, paroxysmal patients, randomized to radiofrequency ablation of drugs, with a primary endpoint over three years of progression to persistent AFib. And as you know, there was a 90% decrease in the progression in the ablation group in red compared to the, the drug group here in teal. And more recently, the progressive AF trial which looked at sort of first-line ablation patients, and again, comparing here cryoablation to antiarrhythmic drugs and a 75% reduction in progression to persistent AFib over three years. So it could be RF or cryoablation, basic results in a four to 10 times less likelihood of progression to persistent AFib over three years. I think this is really important data that's focusing us more toward looking earlier in the disease state. The other one, I think, is this, which is the effect of, um, of catheter ablation on cognition. Now, this is a really nice review article that Jared Bunch wrote, and he looked at the mechanisms by which AFib can affect cognitive decline. One of them, of course, is the obvious one, which is the potential of emboli, macro or microemboli. Uh, and of course, anticoagulation is critical here. But the other one, I think, that we're just starting to understand is the impact of cerebral perfusion, or lack thereof, on on the um, uh, on the brain and the potential impact that maintaining sinus rhythm has. This is a uh, propensity match analysis from the Korean database, and there are now, by the way, several databases: the UK database, others that have looked at this. But what you see is compared to medical therapy in AFib patients, if you look at ablation, there's about a 27% uh, reduction in progression to dementia. And by the way, look at the time horizon here. This is 10 years. So this is something that accumulates slowly over a long period of time. By the way, I think it's unlikely we'll ever see this in a randomized trial just because of how long it takes to see these changes. If you look at um, the type of dementia, there's a reduction in both Alzheimer's dementia and vascular dementia. If you censor for stroke, meaning take away the embolic events as far as we know them, there's still an improvement. So suggesting the improvements in um, non-vascular dementia. What is the mechanism of this? Well, it does seem to be ablation success. You see, 
Patients where there was ablation failure did not show benefit. It's when there was success that there was a benefit. So it's maintaining sinus rhythm that's important in reduction of dementia. What is the mechanism of this? Well, this is some direct data looking at cerebral uh, perfusion, or cerebral hyperfusion, using phase contrast MRI. I'm going to show you two trials. The first is this one, the Aegis Reykjavik study, looking at over 2,000 patients undergoing phase contrast MRI. And what you see, and some patients had no AFib, some patients had paroxysmal, and some patients had persistent. And what you see is the patients compared to no AFib, if they had paroxysmal or persistent, have less cerebral blood flow. The second is this smaller study, 44 patients undergoing cardioversion for persistent AFib. And they separated in the, in these patients into two groups, those that stayed in AFib and those that um, went to sinus rhythm after cardioversion. And here's what you see. This is before cardioversion. This is the brain contrast um, MRI. If you don't have, if you stay in AFib, meaning no difference with cardioversion, basically there's no difference here. And this is what you see, basically no change. In fact, it gets a little bit worse. On the other hand, those that went to sinus rhythm, you have an increase in brain perfusion. And this is something that's now being seen in multiple studies. And I think this is going to be a very important point. The other data, of course, is the AF data in heart failure patients and HEF ref patients. We know about multiple smaller studies, including the larger um, uh, CASEL AF trial, which showed a NNT of only six for improved mortality. Basically, a 50% reduction in mortality improvements in ejection fraction, six minute walk, VO2 max. I mean, I think the question is I, I think there's very little doubt that HEFREF patients will show improvement. I think the key is how do we do these procedures in HEFREF patients who are oftentimes tend to be sicker and do them very quickly and very effectively? HEFPEF patients, there's the Cabana sub study. 35% of the patients in Cabana had heart failure of which the majority, 90%, had preserved ejection fraction. And even on the ITT analysis, there was improvement in mortality with ablation shown here in red compared to drug therapy. Now, this is a secondary analysis of an ostensibly negative trial. So we need to see this prospectively. And there are some trials that are ongoing or being planned. There's also the RAFT-AF trial, but I think that's just an, an underpowered trial, so I won't get into that. The final point I want to make with regards to AF ablation is this. You know, I think we as a EP community have been very strict in terms of what is success. And I think that's good in some ways, but it also, um, I think, um, diminishes the potential role uh, to our cardiology colleagues. And I think many of you have seen this. Of course, you all have patients like this. You have um, uh, the amount of AFib before ablation, ablation procedures here, and everything looks good. But this patient actually had a recurrence. There was a, you know, a, a couple of minutes episode of AFib at this time. Is this a failure? Well, of course, in any Kaplan-Meier curve, this would be a failure. But this is a dramatic reduction in AF burden. This is the, uh, that's a single patient. Here's data from Circadosh showing that if you look at time to recurrence on KM curves, the success is 50%. But if you look at AF burden, it's about a 99% reduction in AF burden. And this is important. We know from the CASEL AF sub-study, if you look here, when the AF burden shown here on the x-axis drops below 50%, the mortality becomes quite low. This is true, by the way, in the ablator group. It's not true in the drug group, mainly because probably because of the toxicity of the drugs. Similarly, this is a study looking at patients who have uh, um, implantable devices, 39,000 patients. Here, the investigators looked at AF burden over the first couple of months, and then based on that burden, they separated the groups and looked at subsequent mortality over three years, and here's what was seen. The more time you have AFib, the more burden there is, the higher the mortality. So I think this is something we need to um, sort of discuss with our colleagues, explain to our colleagues that a reduction AF burden is a real answer. Now, how do we actually demonstrate that? I think this is a more complex question because I think it's unrealistic and probably unreasonable to put implantable loop recorders in all of our patients. Um, I want to move on here to, let's see, yeah, um, pulse field ablation. You've had a number of talks and seen a number of presentations on pulse field ablation about the the there's the, some degree of tissue preferentiality to spare surrounding tissues. We've seen studies like this. This is from Piaget and Hubert Cochet showing that in cryo and RF ablation, 
as well as pulse field ablation, yes, you ablate the atrial tissue, but in cryo and RF, you also ablate the esophagus in about 40% of the patients, and you don't see that with pulse field. I think this is the most dramatic data and the most impressive data. This is some of our first in human work um, uh, using the, the pentaspline catheter, and this is a uh, delayed enhanced image showing the ablated tissue. Uh, we use this, we have a series of publications with Peter uh, and Piaget and, uh, and also Ante Anich showing the success in patients undergoing ablation for paroxysmal AFib. This is a smaller study in patients after PVI where we ablate the posterior wall showing, again, good durability at, with, with remapping and good success, albeit, again, in a very small number of patients, 25. But based on this, there are a number of large randomized trials that are ongoing. The ADVENT trial is done enrollment. This is randomized trial in paroxysmal patients of pulse field versus um, thermal energy. This is going to be reported likely later this year, perhaps ESC or American Heart. There's the ADVANTAGE trial, which just started enrollment very large trial of persistent AF patients, PVI plus posterior wall. It actually, as I said, it has already started enrollment, so this would be a good trial. And then there's the BEAT AF trial, which is a European randomized trial of pulse field versus radio frequency in both paroxysmal and persistent. And the enrollment I know here is ongoing. So I think that's very exciting. I think one of the challenges we're going to have is how to deal with all these various technologies. We have now have a number of technologies. There was the pentaspline catheter, which I already talked about. There are other similar basket type catheters in, in trials around the world. There's also these circul circumlinear catheters, including the post AF trial, which is a non randomized study that reported its data uh, at ACC. There's other designs like the globe catheter, which is going to start clinical trials in the US later this year, the P PFCA catheters, and then there's the focal catheters. Uh, this system, the Galaxy system, the Afera system, which I know you've just seen um, uh, cases of this that can deliver RF and PF, as well as other focal catheters. It's important to know that of these, none of these are FDA approved, but three have CE mark approval. The Pentaspline catheter has been approved for about two years now. This was approved last year, and the Sphere uh, catheter, the lattice tip catheter, this just got approved in Europe uh, literally like a week or two ago. So I think certainly in Europe, you'll have a number of options, though in the US, we're still waiting. Um, I think the one point I'll make is that there, there are only a few examples where there's actually remapping data. And actually, now we have remapping data on the globe also. The majority of these catheters do not have remapping data. And I think that's a very, very important limitation. The acute clinical data always looks good in all these catheters because pulse field just wipes everything out and really doesn't mean much. It has to be remapping data. Without it, I don't even know how to interpret the effectiveness of these catheters. Ideally, they're clinical remapping studies, but at least I think studies have to report what is the remapping results of those patients that came back because of clinical recurrences, because that gives you a good idea of what's happening in the full cohort. Lots of challenges. Uh, if we look on the safety side, so far things look good. No esophageal damage, no PV stenosis. No phrenic nerve palsy in this initial analysis, though I should note there was transient phrenic nerve paresis, meaning it resolved before the hospital discharge, and there's at least one case report of phrenic nerve palsy. So I think the phrenic nerve um, damage can happen, and we need to understand that better. There are other challenges. Probably the most important one, I think, is how much ablation is enough? And I think we need to balance success with, uh, with mechanical dysfunction. I mean, all of our trials at this point have a primary endpoint of success. None of them look at the amount of atrial tissue that we're taking out of the equation. And that's something I think we need to change in terms of how we um, think about this. The effect on autonomic function, There's these are two studies, one from um, uh, Joseph's group and one that uh, Peter and I uh, performed looking at the autonomic effect. I, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but what's very clear is that pulse field has minimal effect on the autonomic ganglia, unlike thermal ablation. What is the impact of that? I think we need to better understand that. So I'm going to skip these slides here. Um, the other one is coronary arterial spasm. This clearly occurs. It can occur with any technology, but it seems to occur pretty reproducibly with pulse field ablation. 
We uh, published this paper showing that remote ablation, meaning a PVI or posterior wall ablation, really does not cause spasm, and we shot the coronaries. It doesn't mean it can never cause spasm, but it doesn't routinely cause spasm. But adjacent pulse field, so if you're ablating right next to the coronary, yes, you can cause spasm, and yes, you can attenuate this by giving either intracoronary or intravenous nitro. So again, I want to emphasize, with PVI or posterior wall ablation, you don't cause spasm. You cause spasm when you're next to a coronary, almost routinely subclinically, and sometimes it becomes clinically relevant. So, and we can also prevent this by uh, using intracoronary IV nitro. So the question is, there's lots to understand about this. How often will spasm become clinically relevant? The real answer is we don't know, but let me show you a, 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 a publication. This is from a, cent a single center, 108 patients who are using the pentaspine catheter. In six of the patients, they performed CTI, and ST elevation was observed in two out of six. In one patient, there was ST elevation, they gave IV nitro and resolved. In the other patient, this is what happened. You can see with the la after the last lesion, four minutes later, you see ST elevation and the inferior leads. Then the blood pressure drops. Eight minutes later, you're starting to see AV block and PVCs. And then nine minutes later, there's a VF arrest, requiring CPR, DC shock, and IV nitro. And the patient did well. But the point is, really, how often does spasm occur? If it really occurs 33% of the time, that's a problem. We'll probably want to be giving nitro prophylactically. If it occurs 1% of the time, then I think we have to make a decision. Is it better to give it prophylactically or expectantly if we start seeing SD changes? What is the best strategy for dosing? I think we still need to figure that out. Will a focal catheter also cause spasm? Remember, with a large catheter, you have a wide um, field. If you have a focal catheter, will it cause spasm? In preclinical studies, the answer is yes. In clinical studies, we need to study this. And finally, are there late coronary effects um, in terms of um, uh, late loss of, of caliber of the vessels? And this is something we need to understand better. You know, as I talk about all these potential complications, you may be thinking, well, is PFA too complicated? Well, I just want to show you this. This is uh, given to me by Steve Mickelson. This is a high-speed camera that you're going to see of an RF lesion. And as it runs, this is what a steam pop looks like. And that's the kind of damage that you cause with the steam pop. I'm just going to let it run again because it's just such a dramatic thing. Um, so just remember, that is what we currently do every day. I mean, not steam pops every day, but the potential every day. Um, you know, I'm sort of losing track of time. Do I have any more time, Jacob? Um, I mean, Joseph, what, how much time is left? You, you can go, Vivek, okay? Just five minutes. Uh, Joseph, are you there? <laughs> is anybody there? Uh, can you hear me, Vivek? Can you hear me? Yes, hi, Peter. Yep. Okay, yes, yes, so yes. you have uh, five minutes, okay, more, okay? Oh, five minutes. Okay. Okay. That's perfect. I, it'll give me a little bit more time to okay. get on my soapbox. Thanks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about risk factor modification, where I see the future of this. Um, this is um, a, uh, I think, a review article from uh, Prash Sanders. who's done a lot of really nice work in this area, as all of you are aware. But what is the actual clinical evidence with regards to atrial fibrillation? It's a little bit more limited, unfortunately. Alcohol, absolutely. There's now randomized data that all of you are aware of, so I won't go into this, that abstinence is very important in terms of reduction of AF burden. But there's no really no data in terms of glycemic control, smoking, or hyperlipidemia. This is not to say that we shouldn't be encouraging our patients to stop smoking and reduce lipids. But the point is, there's really no data on this in terms of atrial fibrillation. What about blood pressure? Again, really no data. What about sleep apnea? Well, I think you're aware of this. The, there's relatively little randomized data, and the only randomized data has been pretty negative. This is do, looking at CPAP in in uh, in sleep apnea patients who are undergoing ablation. And whether you use CPAP before or after ablation, there was really no difference in AF recurrence. The same thing if you look at the AF burden. Now, we should note that larger CPAP trials are ongoing, so we should reserve final judgment, I think, I think until we see those. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is this. Not that CPAP may not help some patients, because I think it does. But, you know, in the past, I we actually had a, a program of checking whether or not every patient in our AFib clinic would have sleep apnea and then we'd refer them to the 
to the sleep doctors. And we basically stopped that because until I see some data showing improvement outcomes, I have other stuff I need to spend my time with these patients on. But I think obesity is an area that's a complicated one. There's a lot of preclinical and mechanic data that indicates that obesity, and particularly um, epicardial adipose tissue, has an important impact on the myocardium, direct effects, pericardial effects, that um, it, through inflammation um, and other cytotoxic effects, leads to atrial fibrillation. The data on this, unfortunately, again, is less um, optimal. I'm not showing the first randomized data that PRAS showed, which showed a reduction in effort, because I thought that was a very nice uh, study. But the only other randomized data that I'm aware of is, the, well, the other major randomized study, because there's some smaller ones, is this SORT AF trial, which looked at three centers randomizing paroxysmal or persistent AFib patients who are obese to either AF ablation or AF ablation plus basically re uh, weight reduction. The weight reduction group did indeed lose more weight, five kilograms versus one kilogram, but no difference in outcomes, no difference in AF burden. On the other hand, there was a difference if you look at success. So those patients that lost some weight, shown here in TO, did better than those that frankly gained weight. But the, so the so the answer seems to be that yes, it would work, but we just have to get better weight reduction. And so what's the future? Well, it may be this. It may be the newer classes of agents, the GLP-1 agonists like semaglutide, uh, semaglutide or trizepatide, which really seem to be quite effective in terms of weight reduction. And these are, again, weight reduction trials. So perhaps strategies like this, when applied to our patients, may improve outcomes. This remains to be shown. But the one other area I would argue in terms of risk factor modification is modulation of autonomic tone. We know uh, from studies like, uh, well, this is, um, there are different ways to modify the autonomic system. The ones that seem to be most relevant, the data for AFib, I'll show you here. One is renal denovation. We know from the eradicate trial that adding renal denovation to PV isolation improved outcomes substantially, a 43% reduction in AF recurrence. This is a meta-analysis that we published with 700 plus patients. And overall, if you look at this, when you add renal denovation, you improve AF recurrence by 32%, meaning reduce AF recurrence by 32%. So I think we need further randomized trials here. This is a trial we're looking at where patients who are undergoing AF ablation don't have refractory hypertension, just have some degree of hypertension, randomized to renal denovation using this ultrasound catheter, which I think is very nice because it's highly effective in uh, preclinical studies. And so we'll have to see what trials like this um, show us. But I think the other really exciting area is transcutaneous autonomic modulation. Some of you may be aware of the work from the Oklahoma group looking at low-level Traga stimulation. There was the TREAT AF trial, which I think sort of unfortunately got lost in the pandemic. This was published just before the pandemic started or as the pandemic started. It was a really nice sham control trial looking at paroxysmal patients randomized to either Traga stimulation or earlobe stimulation, which is basically sham, that does nothing. And what was shown is in the sham group, you have an increase in AF burden over time, exactly what you'd expect. But in the Traga stimulation, not only did it not increase, it actually decreased. And this is a statistically significant result. There was also reduction in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in TNF alpha consistent with its with its uh, suppression of anti-inflammation. So I think this is a very exciting area that needs to be studied further. And what's I think the other exciting area, it may not just be this. There may be other approaches like median nerve stimulation. And there's at least one technology that I'm aware of comes in a wristband that's being studied to affect this. And I think what's really exciting to me is the idea that transcutaneous stimulation could interact with AF ablation. And so if we look at the progression of AFib, you have paroxysmal and persistent. But of course, before this, patients oftentimes have PACs before they become paroxysmal. And of course, there are patients who undergo ablations who have recurrence. So if we look at this life cycle of AFib, right now, what are we doing? In this population, patients who are typically receiving antiarrhythmic drugs, then catheter ablation. Of course, increasingly, some patients are receiving primary catheter ablation. But you can imagine transcutaneous stimulation approaches being used to prevent post-ablation arrhythmias to improve the outcome of ablation. They could be used in these patients to reduce the um, AF burden in paroxysmal patients or perhaps reduce AF recurrence 
in patients undergoing cardioversion. And probably the most exciting is these patients who are just starting to have PACs before we would even consider using drugs or catheter ablation. Perhaps you can reduce the progression of AFib in this population. I think th these are the really exciting areas. So I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop um, and uh, yeah, see if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Vivek, for a very elegant overview of all different uh, topics and technologies. We have, we have also Sabine on line, let's say, and we, we see both of you. So maybe we start the discussion as, uh, you know, for three lectures together. Any question for Sabine? I mean, maybe you first also to say hi and, and and say that how unhappy I am, like Vivek, that I've missed the party. Okay. And it's such an don't, honor. Don't worry, there will be in the future <laughs> some more parties. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We'll, we'll count on that. Perfect. Hey, hey Sabine, it's Peter Neuzel. Hey, hey. It's a very nice, uh, very nice uh, recorded case, very nice introduction of the radial excess. So I have a question for you. Regardless on magnetic navigation, because we just uh, have no navi <laughs> navigation, <laughs> right? So uh, yeah. actually, without navigation, would you, would you see feasible to change our catheters, to change our whatever tools what we are using, to get really to switch to the radial access or brachial radial access? What do you think? Can you yeah, so just I, stress it? To be honest, I have I had this discussion already with a number of colleagues, and um, the beauty of doing this arm approach, we call it arm because it's kind of clear that's kind of somewhere on the arm can be radial, can be high up. Um, is very, very simple. If you if you only steer the tip of a catheter, it's very, very simple. You know, it's, you're pointing in the direction you have enough a magnetic experience to know how easy it was to get the catheter everywhere. And it's just kind of, it's, it's just, I'm trying to push what the magnetic system can do very easily for you. It really doesn't matter where the catheter comes from. Um, and of course, also that catheter needs to be slimmer, ideally needs to be PFA, um, or at least a range of, of configurations of the tip, the thinner, the better. <clears throat> and then we thought, okay, but it still limits us to centers that have the magnetic system. Of course, the magnetic system is expensive. It takes a place in the lab and so on. If you think how easy our colleagues, our coronary colleagues, um, have absolutely no stress to get in the left ventricle, getting retrograde in the left atrium, Negotiating the mitral valve is not that easy. It's something with magnet navigation. Again, I do that all the time uh, in congenital heart disease. That's not difficult. And the fact that the catheter is so soft, is so forgiving, that you basically poke around until you made it. Um, I think that is not so simple, especially if you don't have direct imaging. So if you wanted to have an ice catheter on the tip of that catheter to help you mm -hmm. seeing the valve, because you, you need to see it when it's open and then you slide in. I think it's a lot of innovation ask from um, to make that a mechanical only um, system. It's probably not impossible, but it's, you know, the nice thing about this retrograde approach is that you can get rid of the transeptal part. If you think about why haven't interventional cardiologists not taken up the single shot devices in greater numbers and done as it was predicted that cryo balloons or any single shot would be in the hands of non-EP doctors would help us solve the epidemic of AF patients, patients hitting us. You know, we, we, we're under treating, there's so many more patients than we can treat. And the problem that I see is training people in transeptal punctures and doing that safely. But they're already three quarters of the way to the left atrium, right? If we would manage to get them into the left atrium from a radial approach, we would take all of their expertise and just get them into the left atrium. I think right. it's it would open the field and making simple ablation. I'm not talking about advanced, persistent, massively enlarged atrium and so on, but just the simple paroxysmal AFs that we would only do PVI in. I think that would be a a great technology if you would manage that. So, so the, discussion, the short answer is... 
Not yet. <laughs> but magnetic navigation yeah. makes it very easy. So discussion actually you stressed very nicely. Actually, I well, what we used magnetic navigation as third access for uh, mainly uh, congenital, okay, and actually there's a strange anatomies. Actually, we are approaching, or we were approaching, sorry, we were approaching uh, many times LV, I mean transaortic LV and mitral. But the problem is uh, they need to improve because you know, we still need to have more than contact, okay. We have a contact, but we have we need to have more than we need to have more than contact okay so maybe the technology need to improve even the current one okay even the current stereotaxis need to improve and actually i think i like it because you know uh, you stress very nicely the patient can move immediately they can like same day same day discharge with a like said because you no know, in the us Everybody is stressed by okay uh, hospitalization, so same day discharge is the target. Even no COVID, COVID doesn't matter. So I, I like it. People, what do you think, yeah. people? Well, I think uh, generally it's interesting, but uh, it would require a lot of uh, advancement, uh, as as Sabin described, because I, I cannot imagine that you can do it today without any magnetic navigation or things like that. On the other hand, we, we see now tremendous simplification of the ablation procedure with uh, uh, pulse field as both we have experience in Czech Republic. Just to remind you, we did last year uh, more than 1,300 ablations more, and it was mainly because we started to use in eight centers uh, pulse field, and both our centers did uh, one fifth, one fifth of the worldwide uh, production of, or let's say, volume of cases uh, within one and a half year. So. Uh, th this was only possible because of uh, simplification of the procedure, because you can plan procedure uh, every hour, you can do one procedure every hour. So it's, uh, it's really like if you plan pacemakers or ICDs, you know, implants. So I, I feel that it, it's a it's really interesting concept, um, but it would require a lot of development and, and maybe some completely new uh, ideas how to apply energy or what kind of energy or maybe pulse fields should be used in this way but uh, it's far from uh, potential clinical use I, I would say beyond uh, stereotaxis use as, as you nicely show yeah. let me let me make quickly comment and say <clears throat> what I've seen now in my in my small experience here locally is of course for normal procedures let let's keep the atrial fibrillation aside. So SVTs, PVCs, everything that you can save will cannot easily solve with two catheters. It's really easy. Um, and patients, I give patients, of course, I offer them to have this ablation. And I'm, I'm sure that you also have seen patients who come to the outpatient clinic and say, so doctor, how do you actually do it? Can you do it from my arm? Yeah. And I, I always said, hmm, I would love to, but I didn't. And it was really a matter of my COVID experience on intensive care to say, oh, the vessels are actually bigger than I thought. So <clears throat> then, then that's where, how we started it. But patients actually are super happy about this. You know, I think patients will vote with their feet to a certain extent and say, oh, if I can get it done from my arm, um, ideally radial, then I'm going to go for that. So that's that's a small factor. It's again, it's it's not solving the world crisis of atrial fibrillation or catheter ablation, but. I think if we keep in mind that radial access for coronary intervention took 30 years to come into the kind of mainstay, and that's now over 90% of the procedures are done from a radial approach. When they started in 1989, there was a handful of enthusiasts and, and probably some, I don't know, nerdy people like um, like VEP people normally are, right? We are a bit nerdy. Um, and doing this and, and trying to lead this. This is going to take a time to, to kind of catch on and I completely agree with what you said about PFA. Um, the nice thing about magnetic navigation is you get the catheter everywhere. It's not entirely sure that you always do a great lesion. And that's exactly the shortcoming. So if the lesion would get better, and I expect that from applying PFA through a magnetic catheter, I think we're going to have something that is really... Um, 
competitive in a way, and um, then access doesn't play that role anymore, and contact doesn't play that much of a role anymore, because we know that's going to be low. And again, I hope that I will be continue to be invited to to show the progress on this, and maybe with thinner catheters, maybe with visualization of the lesion. A couple of startups um, that you're all aware of, um, seeing when you have applied enough energy to see that the lesion is good and durable. So that would be a, a big step forward. Any more questions for Sami? No. Uh, I, then uh, Peter has an usual uh, talk. Any question or comment before you think about? I can maybe have comment because uh, I, I mean you can do probably hemodynamic improvement, or you may do uh, maybe even prognostic improvement. But uh, if you still have the arithmogenic tissue on on site, I would not expect uh, that much, uh, let's say, decrease of uh, risk of uh, uh, monomorphic arrhythmias. You can maybe expect uh, some decrease in, in some arrhythmias which can be triggered stable, by yeah. uh, heart failure or by, uh, let's say, um, this advanced remodeling, but uh, probably this uh, monomorphic VTs I, I I doubt that we we can get rid of, and uh, these patients are quite sick. And as as you know, our experience with this radiotherapy, you you can treat maybe this arrhythmia, but they will die anyway. Half of the patients died within uh, two years, uh, uh, so it's they have limited prognosis. So th this is uh, just uh, I. I put it a provocative title, but I, I don't believe that we can just by some uh, anti-remodeling uh, procedures uh, really decrease the number of uh, uh, VTs. So, uh, yeah, it's a very good comment. Actually, I was really surprised when you asked me to make it because I did some several talks for, for VT, uh, for VT uh, conference, whatever. So, uh, actually, we have enough data, what you just mentioned. First, I mean, for bioentrics procedure, which is exclusion of the aneurysm, the substrate stayed there. Okay, so you exclude, you have lessened volume, you improve maybe anatomy, you improve volumetric and uh, I mean, ergonomic situation of the ventricle. But the substrate is still there, and we really prove. I mean, Karl Heinz Cook in Hamburg, and we here in Hamburg, we approved that we have still the problem. So we have two patients within the group of probably less than 100 patients, maybe 150 patients. So we prove that they still have VTs, right? So, but on the other hand, I really want to stress that interventional procedure can reach the better, sometimes better result than surgeons, which is, I mean, again, provocative, but actually we need to get something in between the, the I, mean, I mean, medical therapy, CRT, maybe CCM, and then nothing, right? Like, that, that's the same like with the atrial fibrillation. I mean, we are getting better results than surgeons uh, do uh, <laughs> <laughs> with uh, epicardial yeah. ablation or, or a thoracoscopic approach. I think uh, um, this this is uh, clear. Okay. Uh, no, any question, comment? No. So Vivek, it's your turn. <laughs> Do, do we have any comment for Dr. Reddy? Uh, any question? I have a question for Vivek, okay. Uh, when, when you stated the spasm, okay, because we have now era that actually we have pretty much expanding the procedure, okay. We have a really nice calculation, actually, Peppa just mentioned the numbers. Okay, in, in Czech Republic, small country, right? Like big numbers. And so I mean spasm, okay, spasm, it's most of the spasms are really subclinical. We have some evidence like one, two, three, four, five, I don't know, ten patients with significant changes, ST elevation, clinical relevant, okay. But we must have 
much more spasms and visible. Okay. So what is clinical evidence for you? Uh, what, what's your so actually, if we can add, for example, like atropine in the beginning of the procedure to lessen the need for pacing, and it's effective, okay, clearly effective. So do you think that the nitrates prior, I mean, dosing pre-procedure is effective or is solving the problem? Yeah, I mean, I think I feel like you're, you're um like a plant for this question. Um, I think that, um, um, yes, I mean, I, I think that we don't fully understand the dosing yet. I think we're working that out. Um, I think the question is going to be how often do you need to pretreat? I think your question really is, look how many patients are being treated, and we're not seeing that many clinical spasms. Is this something we really need to worry about pretreatment? I think that's your real question, Peter. And I guess the answer I would say is this. It's only when you have the really bad case that it affects you in terms of how you think about what you should do. I mean, look, the majority of the time, it's pretty clear that we can get away with it, that the spasm either is um, didn't occur or probably more likely occurred but was not critical enough. The problem is, let me, let me just ask you, I'll flip the question around to you. If I think we would all agree that if in one out of 10 cases, when you ablate next to a coronary, you had a cardiac arrest, then we probably want to pretreat. I think we can all agree on that. Yeah. If the answer is one in a thousand, well, then maybe we don't need to pretreat every patient. Maybe we should do it, you know, again, carefully pay attention to ST changes during ablation and give nitro as needed. But the question is, what is that? The answer is going to likely be something in between. It's not going to be one in 10, and it's not going to be one in 1,000. It'll be something closer to, my guess is one in 100, okay? It could be one in 30. And I guess my question to you is this. If 29 cases you do this and you have no problem and you're not even thinking about it, in the 30th case, the patient has a cardiac arrest, and we all know how you know critical a cardiac arrest can be, in terms of the, the 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 stress level, the potential lethality, et cetera, what is your cutoff? It's uh, you know what it's it's a little different situation, right? So, but very provocative question. So uh, so what? It, so is it one in a hundred, one in thirty, one in three fifty? Well, I, I get. Look, I'm. Well, it is a provocative question. I don't even really it's want funny. to answer. Uh, it's can, can I? Can I? Uh, can I uh, uh, intervene? And I would say, I mean, I, I saw really one one clinically relevant spasm with ST elevation with no sequelae, which uh, resolved within a few minutes after administration of isosorbid. In hundreds of cases, we did. So um, I don't believe that if there is a subclinical spasm which does not create any ST elevation, that this can trigger really ventricular fibrillation or, or cardiac arrest. That's why I, I believe that uh, should be some some really sign of uh, ischemia on ECG, which is very sensitive for that. So if we if we get information from a register uh, that there are really more cases or there are cardiac arrests, uh, then we can discuss uh, what is a, a level of trigger. But if, if this is really like anecdot uh, anecdotal anecdotal uh, observation, uh, then uh, I think we are maybe worried too much, uh, yeah, but may maybe not. <laughs> but you know, Vivek, actually, well, let me just give here you a... is the different situation. We have twelve over. We have over twelve, twelve hundred. Okay, twelve, twelve, 12 sorry, twelve thousand. We have twelve. No, worldwide, twelve thousand procedures. Okay, and actually. In Sherry Craig no, no, but hold on. it's wait, about wait. like no, no, wait, 15. Wait, wait. No, no, but, no, but Peter, 15. don't conflate these things. That you may, we may have actually 15,000 PFA procedures, but the majority of them did not include ablation next to a coronary, right? The majority of them were PVI and posterior wall. It's the exceptions that are ablation on the CTI or mitral isthmus. So I think we just have to be a little bit careful. Let me just end with one last story. This is not even about pulse field. This is radio frequency. I've done, you know, probably hundreds of cases of mitral isthmus ablation, right? Haven't seen a problem. 
about a couple of months ago, I had a patient who came in mitosis lesion. I only gave one lesion. I, I, no, that's not true. I gave two lesions, a total amount of RF, and this was from inside the coronary sinus. And as I was sitting there talking to the fellow about how one has to be careful about the coronary, the patient fibrillated. Okay, fibrillate, fine, cardiovert, right? Cardiovert, or, or defibrillation, nothing. Seven or eight de shocks later, patient is still in VF, we're doing chest compressions, trying to shoot the coronary, trying to get vascular arterial axis and everything else in this AFib case. Um, half an hour later, we finally, actually we end up putting in cannulas and put the patient on peripheral bypass, okay? Because he's still in VF. We finally shoot the coronaries, you know, they're completely spasmed, well, they actually it's spasmed down at that left circumflex, and it turned out to be a left dominant system. Um, and um, eventually the patient came back. Eventually the patient was actually able to leave the hospital. But I, I gotta tell you, a case like that changes how I think about the rare complication, especially when we're talking about doing these procedures earlier and earlier in the disease state. So look, I'm not telling you that means that with this anecdotal case, we should be giving nitro to everybody. I'm just saying we have to be a little bit more humble about what we think we should do. So I don't know what the answer ablation. is yet. So you would stop, uh, you would stop uh, pulse field ablation, right, after this? If you have no, no, okay, no, no. Perfect. First of all, that was an RF case. Very nice. No, 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 no. No, no I understand. No, no, RF no. case and PFA. Uh, Pepas, they did it. He has PF, PFA cases, right? So we have actually... I have in my institution now, we calculated 11, 1100 cases. And actually, we may be lucky, but every single potential spasm, actually, we know that we have spasms. No any clinical evidence spasm. No any. No, I guess what I'm telling you, what I'm saying is, this is not an indictment of pulse field. I, I mean, I hope that's very clear. You keep talking about 1,200 cases. Those are 1,200 cases with PFA, with a PVI and posterior wall. It's a subset that had um, uh, mitral or, or CTI. What I'm saying is we, may, we should probably consider giving nitro prophylactically more often than we do. That's all I'm saying. So well, let's set up the it's, dosing. Okay. No, it's, it's also uh, interesting what you mentioned that we we may have differences between uh, unipolar and bipolar, um, between different tools, uh, because uh, we have some yeah. experience also with Afera, which is uh, different from uh, from uh, Farapals, obviously. So it's, uh, it's really, we are at the beginning of a completely new era. So we have to study uh, all these uh, side effects. We have to uh, record them. And we have to find out uh, maybe some, uh, some need for prophylactic administration of drugs like we administer typically atropine, as, as Peter mentioned. So, yeah, I agree. I don't want to uh, somehow uh, dismiss that this is important topic, but uh, maybe, you know, every discussion with people who do not use uh, pulse field is, and what about spasms? This is very uh, high <laughs> risk. You know? well, so I this is typical. This, this is quite typical. No, no, I agree with that. I mean, I think we have to keep this in uh, in context. I 100% you know agree with that Vivek, point. After, after your comment about your RF complication, I would stop this RF. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd say something ridiculous like that. <laughs> yeah. I I, maybe maybe uh, I can have a small comment as well. I think this is, this is actually <clears throat> it's a matter of rare events and then a 33% event rate. That's a different thing. So this kind of uh, experience that Vivek described has been published. Actually, I just left Hamburg and, and that is now 15 years ago. And the same thing had happened there as well. And the patient was not recanalized, was not acted as quickly and ended up in the end with a reduced LV ejection fraction and an ICD because of VTs and had two more VT ablations. Um, and only came in for paroxysmal AF and someone decided that the lateral isthmus line was, was important and that was added. And that started the trouble. So I think there's a difference um, in kind of frequency of these kind of things. And I completely agree that with PFA, I see it like still an, a bit of an untamed or unresolved new energy source. There are so many variations in the waveforms, the energy applied, the duration, everything else. I mean, if you remember... Fred Wittkamp shooting on the coronary without any impact 
Yeah. Kind of in the initial animal yeah, but, um, data but, that he but showed us. But that's that is again uh, what we always exactly. discuss: that pulse field is not uh, there is no class effect. No class effect <laughs> is uh, you have to study every uh, every platform, every energy, uh, let's exactly. say uh, every generator differently because uh, th th this is no nothing uniform, you know. So th this is important exactly. message for everybody. <laughs> so it's not like RF or cryo where you have a very limited number of uh, differences where you. You can or variables we can change but this is completely different story but we are i believe and i hope that all believe now uh, that we are at the beginning of a new era in uh, cathedral ablations with uh, pulse field and especially for complex arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation and ventricle arrhythmias so saying that i i think we have to close uh, our uh, meeting uh, because uh, um, we we had a plan to finish at uh, uh, 1.45, uh, we are a little bit over, but uh, I would like to thank to both of our uh, remote speakers, I would say, and I hope that uh, we will see them next time. Uh, I would like to thank all uh, uh, speakers here and, and operators and also all participants for coming, for sharing uh, their experience in discussions, for uh, friendship and I would also like to thank to sponsors because without their uh, help it would be impossible or very difficult to organize a meeting of uh, such a scale and uh, mainly, uh, mainly Abbott, uh, Cardion and Medtronic uh, which are our platinum sponsors but there are also some others like Biosense, Webster, Boston Scientific, Medion and also to company which organizes uh, all logistics, uh, which is CCL company, and, and namely uh, to Hanna Klimentova, who was the main uh, sort of uh, uh, organizer of, of, this, uh, of this meeting. So um, thank you again to all of you, and I hope that we will meet uh, next year or in the future again in Prague in spring uh, for uh, next edition of this meeting and for all of you who are here a uh, safe trip home and uh, um, stay stay healthy and come next year again okay.